This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. It is just before Christmas, as this show plays on more than 100 radio stations internationally in five countries. And most of you have been pummeled by the pandemic, I know that. Many of you were kicked around by the economy, at least, until this thing is over. And with all that, why can't we take a week to tune out? Take a holiday with not so much talk about climate doom. I used to do that. I'd put out a show with some music, green music. But you know what? We've waited so many years for climate action now that we don't have a week, a month, or a year to lose. Coming up, the fork in the road towards the unsustainable hothouse Earth or a human stabilized planet where we have to monitor and keep track of the temperature and make it go right. We will hear one of my 2018 interviews with Professor Will Steffen. It is about one of the most important scientific papers in this century. And then we search for the tipping points that could force the climate into hothouse Earth. These are the planetary boundaries. You will hear top Swedish scientist Johan Rockström on Radio Ecoshock as I recorded it in 2016. Let's get going. In last week's Radio Ecoshock show, Professor Will Steffen told us, So, even when we know climate change is coming and it's going to be dangerous, can we really make a plan to survive the breakdown of society? I mean, isn't the point being that society breaks down and things don't work anymore? You know, I think the point is uh, we need to do everything we can to avoid that sort of scenario. Uh, and and, and there's a lot of people are now saying time is running out rapidly to avoid that. And this is really, in a way, the fork in the road that we uh, envisaged in that 2018 paper on, on Earth system trajectories. That the, the fork in that pathway between stabilized Earth and hothouse Earth probably lies this decade, maybe in the first half of the decade. Certainly, I think by 2030, we, we will have put ourselves on one of the other pathways, and it'll be difficult to shift. That's why it's extremely important now that people understand the seriousness of this risk and, and understand that the students are right. This is an emergency situation, and we actually do have to make the right choices over the next couple of years. In 2019, the same team published a paper on feedbacks that could take us to hothouse Earth. I have to look into that further. To really understand where we are, and where we are headed, I will read you a couple of key paragraphs from the 2018 paper, Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene. The authors, led by Will Steffen, say this of stabilized Earth. This analysis applies that even if the Paris Accord target of 1.5 degrees C to 2 degrees C rise in temperature is met, we cannot exclude the risk that a cascade of feedbacks could push the Earth system irreversibly into a hothouse Earth pathway. The challenge that humanity faces is to create a stabilized Earth pathway that steers the Earth system away from its current trajectory toward the threshold beyond which is hothouse Earth. The human-created stabilized Earth pathway leads to a basin of attraction that is not likely to exist in the Earth system's stability landscape without human stewardship to create and maintain it. Creating such a pathway and basin of attraction requires a fundamental change in the role of humans on the planet. This stewardship role requires deliberate and sustained action to become an integral, adaptive part of Earth system dynamics, creating feedbacks that keep the system on a stabilized Earth pathway. They continue, if the world societies want to avoid crossing a potential threshold that locks the Earth system into the hothouse Earth pathway, then it is critical they make deliberate decisions to avoid this risk and maintain the Earth system in Holocene-like conditions. This human-created pathway is what we call stabilized Earth, and that's where the Earth system is maintained in a state with the temperature rise no greater than 2 degrees C above pre-industrial, a super Holocene state. Stabilized Earth could require deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions, protection and enhancement of biosphere carbon sinks, 
efforts to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, possibly solar radiation management, and adaptation to unavoidable impacts of the warming already occurring. In essence, a stabilized Earth pathway could be conceptualized as a regime of the Earth system in which humanity plays an active planetary stewardship role in maintaining a state intermediate between the glacial interglacial limit cycle, we emphasize that stabilized Earth is not an intrinsic state of the Earth system, but rather one in which humanity commits to a pathway of ongoing management of its relationship with the rest of the Earth system. That was a reading from the paper Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene, as published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, August 14, 2018. Let's go to my interview with lead author Will Steffen about this overview of our plight. This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. Planet Earth is hurtling towards a new, hotter state. But how hot? Are there landing spots that are safe enough for a human civilization? We get a big step towards answers with new science published by the National Academy on August 6th. The title is Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene. The paper is from a distinguished team of scientists led by Dr. Will Steffen. Will was educated in the American South and transplanted to Australia, where he led research institutes and advised governments. Currently, Dr. Stefan is an emeritus professor at the Australian National University and a counsellor with the Climate Council of Australia. He's also a senior fellow at the Stockholm Resilience Centre. Will Stefan, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you very much. I have to tell you, it's been a horrible summer in the Northern Hemisphere. The global fire map is like something I've never seen. I was wiped out by smoke and other regions were whipped with strings of wet and windy storms. Will, do you think we have already embarked on serious climate change? Yeah, I certainly have, and uh, you can mirror that down here in the Southern Hemisphere. When you look across Australia, we've had uh, a couple of mass bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, killing a, a high percentage. I think up to 30% of that reef is gone. We've seen fires, too. Um, in fact, our fire season ex is extending at both ends, and it's now occupying 11 months out of the 12 months of the year. Uh, we've, seen, we've got serious drought now in, in New South Wales and Queensland. So, yeah, I think climate disruption is happening at an alarming rate pretty much right around the planet. Now, to begin, for the layperson, is there a difference between a tipping point, as popularized by Al Gore, well, 12 years ago, and the thresholds that you look for in this paper? No, they're pretty much the same thing. We, we use the term tipping element, which is actually the physical system which could, within it, have a tipping point or threshold. So uh, those uh, two terms are used pretty much synonymously. In our paper, what we're trying to say is that in addition to individual parts of the Earth having tipping points, example being the, the Arctic sea ice, or perhaps the Amazon rainforest, uh, we're talking about uh, a number of these things acting together. Well, I'd like to go through the four main questions you worked with in order, and they're understandable to all of us and go far beyond just scientific curiosity. These are things we need to know and that governments need to know. So question one, quote, is there a planetary threshold in the trajectory of the Earth system that, if crossed, could prevent stabilization in a range of intermediate temperature rises? That's a pretty scary question, isn't it? Could you explain it a bit? Yeah, look, I think the, the, the dominant framework for the climate change issue is that our emissions of greenhouse gases will be the dominant driver no matter how hot it gets. In other words, the more we emit, the hotter it gets. Once we stop emitting, the Earth is going to stay there. In other words, we could park it at 2 or 3 degrees and it'll stay there. We're saying that the Earth is not a simple system. It's a complex system, and a lot of complex systems have behavior which uh, looks at sharp transitions between a couple of well-defined states. So our argument is that there are a number of individual tipping elements that have their own thresholds in the Earth system, plus some other feedbacks which may not have thresholds but still accelerate climate change. These can act together like a stack of dominoes. When you start pushing one domino, it knocks another off and another off, and together that line of dominoes falling constitutes a planetary threshold. So we are um, hypothesizing with a 
fair bit of evidence that there exists a planetary threshold somewhere probably between one and a half and two degrees and, and four degrees, that if we go across that, the, the Earth system, it's going to move to a much hotter state out of our control. So that's, that's basically what that first question is designed to address. And in our paper, we say, yes, there is likely to be a planetary threshold. And you've already talked really about the second question, which is, if there is a threshold, where is it or maybe when is it? And uh, you've, you've touched on that. So question three, uh, quote, if a threshold is crossed, what are the implications, especially for the well-being of human societies? Okay, well, there are whole books written about possible impacts of a hotter world, but can you give us some clues? Yeah, well, one of the things you'd obviously see is, is an enormous increase uh, in extreme weather events. Uh, and we're already seeing some of this, but this would be extreme weather on steroids. It'd be fires, droughts, uh, extreme heat, big changes in rainfall, extreme rainfall events, uh, worse tropical cyclones or hurricanes in the northern hemisphere, and so on. That's an obvious one. But I think another one that's sort of a sleeper there that people don't think about so much is that we have designed and built our, our civilizations around reasonably stable patterns of uh, temperature and rainfall. For example, big agricultural zones, central USA is a good example, western Europe is a good example, uh, Indo-Gangetic Plain, northeast China. These together feed billions of people. And if we cross the threshold and rapidly go toward a half-house earth state, all of those systems are going to be disrupted. And it's hard to predict exactly how they're going to be disrupted. So what, what this means is uh, just something as simple and basic as providing food for the human population is going to become a massive and difficult task. So that's a good example of, of what's coming our way. Another one is that sea level is going to uh, rise and continue to rise for centuries and centuries uh, as we go on to a hothouse earth trajectory. We're estimating somewhere between 20 and 40 meters of sea level rise could eventuate uh, way down the track. It takes a long time for the ice to melt. But you could get sea level rise rates as high as two meters a century. Uh, and that's a pretty high rate. Uh, that now comes into a human perspective in terms of uh, a very large amount of coastal infrastructure that then becomes vulnerable. And you can go on and on. It's, it's, it's not a very pretty picture when you actually start uh, looking at it in detail. Well, I'd like to leave until later the question about what human actions could save us from the worst of a hothouse world. It's important, but there's a couple things I'd like to get to first, including in the AR5, or the fifth assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that was finalized in 2014, and it talked about a medium confidence that a threshold for abrupt and irreversible climate change exists. Does your paper go beyond medium confidence that that threshold is there? Yeah, I, I think we've got much higher confidence than that, because as we say, all of these processes that would form a planetary threshold, we've seen how they've operated in the past, so they're real processes. Also, we have a fair bit of evidence that some of them, even at a one degree temperature rise, are being destabilized. Arctic sea ice is a good example of that, Amazon forest is another example of that, and so on. And we see weakening of, of longer term ocean and, and, and terrestrial carbon sinks. So this isn't fanciful stuff. These things are already starting to happen. So I think we could uh, reinforce what the IPCC said and say that with new knowledge, we could upgrade that probability to higher than medium. Now we've really got to do some work to try to pin down a little bit more precisely where that threshold might lie uh, in terms of temperature rise. But does this threshold idea compare with the planetary boundaries advanced by your co-author Johan Rockström and his team in Sweden? Very much so, because what we're saying is, and the planetary boundaries are a reasonably conservative approach, saying that if we want to be really certain or with a very high degree of prob probability that we're going to maintain a Holocene-like state of the Earth system, then we have to make sure we avoid these thresholds and these feedback processes. So we've set boundaries for nine processes. One of them is obviously CO2 in the atmosphere, but there are others like the amount of uh, important biomes, uh, forests you can lose, uh, and things like that. So the planetary boundaries approach is actually saying if you want to be really sure that you're going to avoid the sort of hothouse earth trajectory we're painting in this paper, then you stay within the boundaries. Is the hothouse Earth pathway different from runaway climate change, as Dr. James Hansen once suggested was possible? It depends on what you mean by runaway. We never use the term because it's, it's something that, that we don't talk about in complex systems uh, theory or analysis. 
What we're saying is that there are other states of the Earth system which are actually stable. They don't run away, but they are much hotter than the one that uh, we've developed our civilizations in. And what we're saying is that one of those states, the hothouse Earth one, could be accessible if we cross these thresholds. So you, we, we're uh, hypothesizing that if you cross that threshold, you get a period of very rapid climate change. But this isn't runaway. It's going to restabilize at a hotter state with much less ice at the poles, much higher sea levels, different rainfall patterns, and so on. And we, we've seen a state like that in the recent past. The, the so-called mid-Miocene, about 15 or 16 million years ago, uh, was just like that state, and, and the, the continents were about in the same configuration. So this sort of thing is plausible. So no, we don't use the term runaway. It's going to keep going on forever. But the Earth could shift to a much hotter, much less hospitable, stable state. It worries me a bit that this paper calls for stewardship of the entire Earth system, including the biosphere. Frankly, we've utterly failed at stewardship. The idea of humans running the biosphere is a bit frightening to me. Maybe we need to greatly decrease our numbers and impacts to allow the biosphere to self-regulate. What do you say? Well, that's a good point, and, and stewardship isn't management. They're two very different terms. Uh, in fact, stewardship, in, in, in my view of the word, and, and, and it's... it's um, proper meaning, is that we really manage ourselves to become good stewards, which is exactly what you say, allow natural processes to reestablish. In other words, we need to protect major biomes like the Amazon rainforest. We don't manage it, we just take our pressure off of it. So I think you're absolutely right on that. And uh, I think if you read the, um, the supplementary info, we, did, we had some limited space in the main text, we go into more detail about what stewardship actually entails. But we were very careful not to use the word management, but to use the word stewardship. The mainstream chatter is usually about technological fixes needed to keep this civilization, we hope, going more or less the way it is. But your paper goes beyond that, calling for, quote, behavioral changes, new governance arrangements, and transformed social values Maybe that's more important than a technical fix. Your thoughts? Absolutely. And that's a point I think we made very clearly, so I'm glad you picked up on that. Technological fixes is more the same. And the more you look at them, the more they're taking the old cause-effect linear logic without considering that, that those actions are embedded in a complex system that may surprise you with how, how they react. So a transformed value system is, as you said earlier, we become... Uh, stewards of the, of, the, of the system, which means we actually manage ourselves to uh, take pressure off of the Earth system and allow it, allow many of the natural processes and feedbacks to operate. They've uh, kept the place stable for about 12,000 years and allowed us to develop. Uh, and now we're really, really disrupting that. So you're absolutely right. I, I, and I think the other thing I'll just say quickly, we've had two decades of really understanding the climate change problem. And we've made virtually no progress at getting on top of it. So that just tells you, just from pure observation, that the present system is failing, failing really, really badly. So that's why we actually said it's more than technology. It's more than fiddling a bit at the edges. Um, we actually have to really transform ourselves, our societies, and our value systems. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm your host, Alex Smith, with my guest, Dr. Will Steffen. Will is known internationally in climate circles and beyond, and he's based in Australia, but he also works with the Stockholm Resilience Center. We're talking about a new paper that lays out possible futures for the world climate, and some are livable and others not so much. So, Will, figure three in the new paper is titled Global Map of Potential Tipping Cascades. What is a tipping cascade? Well, this is like the row of dominoes, where one of these individual processes that has a tipping point tips, and it changes the Earth system. It, it, it can melt ice and uncover more dark ocean or land, which absorbs more sunlight, heats the planet more, or it can emit CO2 or methane to the atmosphere or both, which warm the Earth further. And as the Earth warms further, more of these tipping elements then become vulnerable. They start to tip. They increase the temperature further. Some of these elements actually operate by changing ocean circulation, which moves heat through the ocean uh, from hemisphere to hemisphere. So there are a number of connections that once you start tipping some of these elements, they change the Earth system such that they tip other elements. And it's, uh, I think the best analogy is a, a, a sort of winding row of dominoes where you, where you start knocking the first couple over and it takes off. So that's what, it, what we call a tipping cascade. And this is the fundamental process underneath the fact that the planet as a whole may have a threshold. 
This is very interesting to me because, uh, in a way, I've been having an argument with Dr. Guy McPherson about tipping points, and he said that positive feedback loops can work on each other and, and make each other go stronger, and in a way, that's what your graphic shows. Uh, that's exactly what we're saying. Yep, that's, that's a good way of putting it. All right, and apparently, we can never go back. Have we already knocked out the cycle of glaciers known for the past few million years? Yes, I think there's good evidence that we will not go into the next glaciation, so we'll miss that. So uh, we'll miss a glaciation for about 100,000 years just with what we've already uh, done to the Earth's system. Now, some people may argue that's a good thing, but in fact, that's only the beginning of what's, what's happening if we keep on our present trajectory. Uh, and that's what this paper is arguing, is that if we keep on the present trajectory, uh, we're going to go to a much, much hotter state of the Earth's system. So that, of course, would eliminate glaciations for even longer than, than 100,000 years, probably. What's our best hope for a stabilized Earth? That's a good question, and I think people in the humanities and social sciences may have a better answer than I do. All I would say is that we scientists, I think natural scientists, have to do a better job of articulating what the real risks are. And that's what this paper is intended to do. It's intended to be a wake-up call to say, we really need to reframe the risks of what we're doing to the planet's climate system and to the Earth system as a whole. I think humanities scholars and social science scholars would have some good ideas about how we actually do start getting a transformation of values, a reorganization of societies, and so on. That's a bit outside of my area of expertise, only to say that I think uh, we have enough evidence to say our present system isn't going to solve this problem. So we have to think and act at a much deeper level uh, to transform our societies. Well, I'm going to try and go a little deep here, and I can't explain it very well because I'm not a scientist, but I noticed that Dr. Joachim, or John Schellenhuber, is a co-author of your new paper. And in his 2011 speech at the Four Degrees or More conference in Australia, which I broadcast on Radio Ecoshock, he said something that always made me wonder. Now, according to my blog notes about that speech, he said studies in physics show the temperature is unlikely to stay anywhere around the 7 degrees C hotter mark. Simple calculations about the wave patterns of matter, he said, suggest the temperature would either rest around 5 degrees or keep migrating up to 10 degrees hotter, where there's another kind of natural plateau. And your paper also talks about possible resting points based on potential energy of the system. It's deep stuff, but can you comment? Yeah, look, ours, ours roughly corresponds with John's five degrees. We're, we're suggesting four and five degrees. John's a, a really excellent theoretical physicist on top of everything else he knows about the Earth system. So he's attacking it from one angle. We're looking at, for example, analogs in the past. So you can see that the Earth system has existed for a long period of time, millions of years, in certain states, and then they, it transitions between these states. And one of these states we see in the recent past, of course, is one that's about four or five degrees uh, hotter than today, much less ice, quite different uh, climate system. And that, we think, could be accessible if we cross those thresholds or get that cascade going in the next couple of decades. And there has been a kind of monoculture among some climate scientists and climate activists where it's all about the carbon but humans have plenty of other impacts, like driving species extinct or cutting down forests or polluting with plastics, and some of those could change the biosphere that supports climate stability. So I was relieved your study went beyond simple carbon counting. Do we need more of that in science? Absolutely. Um, the, the paper does focus on the climate system, but again, in the supporting information, you'll see uh, a broader view of, of the Earth system as a whole. And I think a good way of looking at it is, is we have the Earth system is made up of two big interacting spheres at the highest level, the geosphere, which people focus on, the physical climate system, but also a biosphere. And in fact, carbon is a, is a beautiful link between the two. We think of carbon only as uh, something that warms the climate if you put too much of it in the atmosphere, but in fact, it's, it's the real currency of the biosphere itself. And uh, we're changing, in addition to burning fossil fuels, of course, we're changing the biosphere directly uh, in a myriad ways. And, and that, at the moment, is actually more important than the climate impacts on the biosphere. So, yes, it's extremely important that we take a, a much more holistic, integrated view of the Earth system uh, and of human impacts on the Earth system. Well, as I said, here in British Columbia and all along the west coast of America, we've just gone through another terror summer of wildfires with massive smoke. And I wonder if the release of all that carbon from trees could affect the climate, 
Your paper says it's possible, yes? It, cer- it certainly is. In fact, one of the um, tipping elements or tipping processes we talk about are the vast boreal forests of Canada, Alaska, Siberia, Scandinavia. And yes, they can emit a lot of carbon to the atmosphere. So, uh, and we see it's the best data, in fact, is from Canada, that we see long term changes that uh, the Canadian forests were basically a sink, they were a net absorber of carbon for much of the 20th century. But around about the 1970s or so, as, as temperatures started creeping up, we saw, particularly in western Canada, an increase in spruce bark beetle attacks on, on the trees, which weakened the trees uh, and made them more prone to disturbances. And, of course, with, uh, with uh, ever-increasing temperature, fires became more probable. And so you had this, this double whammy of, of trees weakened by insect attacks and then fires sweeping through them. And the Canadian Forest Service has done an excellent job of actually tracking the carbon implications of all that. Uh, and uh, I found that over the 30 years post-1970, those forests have gone to being carbon neutral at best and sometimes even net emitters of carbon to the atmosphere. So that's already a big, a big effect on, on the global carbon cycle. And what would be the worst trajectory, this hothouse Earth? What would it be like if humans survived to see it? Okay, if, if, if you look at, uh, for example, Australia, much of Australia would be uninhabitable. You simply couldn't live there unless people were trucking in water and you lived in air condition conditions for 24-7. And you can do that around the Earth. Large areas of the tropics and subtropics become uninhabitable. Uh, as I said before, the, the world's big agricultural zones would have to change. They would, most of them would be damaged beyond repair by a rapidly ch- changing climate. Sea levels would just continuously rise. Uh, extreme weather events would be much, much worse than they are now. Uh, and John Schellenhuber himself, um, I think in that 2011 uh, lecture he gave at Melbourne, said it's not inconceivable that if we go to something like a half-house Earth, we will have a civilization and population crash. Uh, and he suggested down to maybe a maximum ca- carrying capacity of 1 billion humans. We're about 7.5 now. So this is really a collapse scenario. And that's, that's what I think the worst case scenario is, in fact, a collapse scenario, uh, that the contemporary civilization we have today simply cannot exist in a half-house Earth. Yes, and we know people have to slash greenhouse gas emissions to keep a livable world, and we've had experts on this show go further, saying we will need to reduce incoming sunlight with geoengineering. But your group adds a third way, namely, quote, enhancing or creating carbon sinks. Will, what can we do there? Well, obviously, the first thing we can do is protect and restore a lot of the the terrestrial sinks uh, that we talked about, Amazon, uh, other tropical forests, some temperate forests protect the boil. But also there's a huge carbon, potential carbon sink in the ocean. Uh, the, the ocean's a big player in the carbon cycle. So protecting uh, coastal zones, uh, they absorb a lot of carbon. There have been proposals that, that macroalgae, big seaweed, can be enhanced, the growth of that, and that would uh, absorb a lot of car- carbon. Of course, you've got to get that then down deeper in the ocean to have it there for any length of time. So basically the way we, we look at it is about a quarter of the carbon that's up there today that's causing the problem actually originated from the biosphere. So getting that back into the biosphere and protecting it would actually be a big step forward. Of course, that's no substitute for fossil fuel, and that's the problem. Of a, lot, a lot of people think, well, we'll just grow trees. No, it's not a, sub- a substitute at all. All it does is, is restore some of the earlier emissions uh, from the biosphere. So if we want to have a habitable world, it sounds like we need to change everything, our consumption, our behavior, our attitudes. I've studied history. I have difficulty recalling such a huge revolution in such a short time frame, maybe at the start of World War II, maybe. Is it really still possible, Will Stephan, to steer Earth without going into that hellish hothouse ditch? Uh, Good question. I think it's a big ask. Uh, I think we may have some chance to do it. Humans can move uh, extremely quickly. There are tipping points and radical changes, changes of state in human societies as well, often on the catastrophic side, but occasionally you see societies that reform themselves reasonably quickly. We did after World War II. That's probably the most recent example of where uh, older, more feudal systems around the world were, were torn down really by this succession of World War I, Great Depression, World War II. And there were quite different economic and governance systems that came out of that. So that was one example, but it took some catastrophic events to trigger that. Uh, this time, by the time we get to really catastrophic events, it may be too late. Uh, if we're right on our, on our uh, hothouses uh, and planetary threshold. So we have to have the foresight to transform ourselves 
before we actually get into a situation where the Earth system is out of control. Yes, foresight. That's what we need. So you have advised the Australian government in various ways, and lately Australian politics have gone further off the rails towards more coal development and climate denial. Meanwhile, as you say, farmers in New South Wales are allowed to shoot kangaroos because the drought is so awful. What now for Australia? Well, I think we're actually, if you look at Australia, uh, Australian society is somewhat in a complex systems view. We're getting much more uh, variability now in the system. Over the past 10 years, we've gone from uh, prime ministers who've vigorously supported action on climate change. We put in a meaningful carbon price. That got overthrown. Now we're going through a succession of uh, prime ministers at an increasing rate, mainly because of the climate change issue. That's the underlying thing that's destabilizing politics. But at the subnational level, we have some really positive signs. Uh, states like South Australia are already over 50% renewable. Our, our own little uh, Australian Capital Territory, which is sort of the equivalent of D.C. in, in the U.S., will be 100% renewable in, in about 18 months. And we've done that over about eight or nine years. So, and that's a city of about half a million. So you can transform really fast if you put your mind to it. And I think Canberra's crossed a tipping point where now, although there was a lot of angst about how much it would cost to get carbon out of our electricity system, now we want to get carbon out of our entire territory economy by 2045, and it's got widespread support, no problem from the Treasury and economists. So I think we've crossed a tipping point to realize we can actually do this, and it's actually going to benefit us uh, in other ways in addition to the uh, climate benefits. So I'm hoping that, that things like this, that these social tipping points can come in in time to, to help us get on the right pathway. It sounds like people and the local governments have just gone ahead well past what the retrograde national government is doing, and that offers some hope for the United States as well. Indeed. I think that's a good example, too, in the United States. And it's, there's probably a reason for that. I think the big vested interests that want to maintain the fossil fuel world operate at the big levels in, in governance, operate at the na nation-state levels, whereas people who actually f understand the risks and feel the impacts already today want to get on with solving it. And the best thing they can do now without uh, getting the, the national governments moving is to get moving at the local level. And that's happening around Australia, too. As we wrap up, is there anything else you would like to tell our listeners? All I would say is make one more point to your listeners. Often people, when I talk about this paper and other aspects of my work, they say, ah, oh, but, you know, give us hope. Can you please give us some hope? And my answer is, actually, you make hope. People themselves make hope. And that's what we've done in Canberra. Uh, we've got a much better attitude toward this problem because we're actually going out and doing things and making a difference. So my, my response to people is, you can do something. And the best thing you can do is, is get active on this, change your local politics, try to change your national politics. That'll generate hope. We've been speaking with Dr. Will Steffen, Emeritus Professor at the Australian National University and part of the Climate Council of Australia. He's the lead author of a new paper, Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene. It is available in full text for free, and you can find links to that, plus some quotes and comments, in my own show blog at ecoshock.org. Will Steffen, thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with our listeners. Thank you, Alex. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. <laughs>